Thank you, Lori. Um, let me, uh, first of all, give everybody a reminder that if you miss some or all of these classes and you're interested in uh, catching up or watching them, Spark does have a YouTube channel where Lori puts those classes up. I'm not quite sure how long after we actually do them, but it's not that long afterwards. So uh, I know somebody sent me an email earlier this week and said they needed to leave at 11 this morning, just to let me know, I guess. Um, and I said, well, to the extent that you missed something, you can go on the YouTube channel and catch up on that as though you were watching it live uh, shortly after we actually have the class. So keep that in mind. You should have an email someplace back in your email from Lori that gives you the link to, uh, to that Spark uh, YouTube channel. Uh, let me warn you also that I have a lot of stuff I want to cover today, at least in terms of quantity. And I may take... Uh, uh, artistic, that's not the right word, license, teacher's license perhaps, to go over the time that's allotted. And so feel free to drop off if you have to, uh, realizing that um, whatever I cover after you leave will be on that YouTube uh, channel unless we run out of tape or time or something like that on there. So with that in mind, let's get started and let me try to move through what I've got today fairly, fairly rapidly. Uh, I hope you find it as interesting as I do in any event. So just to do a fairly quick review, last time uh, we began talking about President Truman's 1948 State of the Union Address, which he gave on January the 7th of 1948. This is considered by most historians part of Truman's re-election campaign, or at least a political component of his campaign. We explored Truman's introductory remarks, especially what he had to say about the strength of the American people being derived from their spiritual and moral character. What he had to say about the significance of the history and significance of religious faith in the American story was something I tried to emphasize to give you more of a picture of the man, Harry Truman, and how he approached the issues he raised in that speech. I tried uh, to make it clear that President Truman based his goals and proposals regarding his domestic agenda upon three particular values tolerance, unselfishness, and brotherhood. Anyway, we talked about the first goal he included in his speech, which was to secure fully the essential human rights of our citizens. This boiled down to what he had to say both in the State of Union address and his connected and directly related special message to the Congress, which he delivered on February 2nd, which really fleshed out what he was proposing to the Congress in the area of civil rights. I probably spent more time in discussing what President Truman said, proposed and recommended concerning civil rights than I might have, but I thought particularly in light of current events that a detailed look back to President Truman and his State of the Union address to the Congress related to civil rights at least was worth our time in that class. I hope you agreed. Also, since this is a class on the presidential election of 1948, it's important to look at the position Truman took on civil rights and how it might have impacted the race for the Democratic nomination and the general election that followed. There was clearly a political component, both pro and con, to the progressive position Truman took on civil rights. David McCullough writes regarding what Truman said about civil rights in his State of the Union speech, and I'm quoting McCullough here, whether the message was bad or good politics in the year 1948 was a matter of opinion. Clark Clifford was certain that the president was doing the right thing morally and politically. To boss Ed Flynn of the Bronx, who was no less concerned about losing the black vote in New York than he had been in 1944, it was extremely welcome news. But the angry outcry on the Hill suggested that if Truman meant what he said, he was finished in the South, and therefore in November as well. Southern, Southern congressmen lashed out in language often too raw to print. When several Southern Democrats meeting privately with the president suggested all would turn out well if he softened his words, Truman, in a written reply, said his own forebearers were Confederates, and he came from a part of Missouri where Jim Crow as, Crowism still prevailed. Quoting from Truman's written reply, but my very stomach turned over what I when I learned that Negro soldiers 
just back from overseas who are being dumped out of army trucks in Mississippi and beaten. Whatever my inclination as a native of Missouri might have been, as president, I know this is bad. I shall fight to end evils like this. That was contained in his written reply to the Southern congressman. Back to McCullough's quote. Of all the president's aides and cabinet officers, no one had done more than Clark Clifford to push for a strong stand on civil rights as a part of a larger effort to, in Clifford's words, strike for new high ground whenever confronting the Republican Congress. And it was strategy based on close study, no less than moral conviction. For Clifford did nothing without careful preparation and planning. Now it's time to move on and take a look at the balance of the State of the Union address and proceed with a discussion of the election of 1948. So, with regard to the State of the Union message, President Truman's second uh, stated goal was to protect and develop our human resources. Truman coupled the first goal, which we've already talked about, to secure fully the essential human rights of our citizens with what he said about accomplishing his second goal. Here is what he said. The safeguarding of the rights of our citizens must be accompanied by an equal regard for the opportunities for development and their protection from economic insecurity. In this nation, the ideals of freedom and equality can be given a specific meaning in terms of health, education, social security, and housing. So the specific areas Truman had in mind when, returning, when referring to the development of the citizenry of the United States were the health and medical care of the American people, the education of the American people, the economic security of certain segments of the American people, as then addressed by the social security system, and the housing needs of the nation. Here is some of what he said about those topics. Over the past 12 years, we have erected a sound framework of social security legislation, yet our system has gaps and inconsistencies. It is only half finished. Of course, here Truman was speaking of the Social Security Act, which FDR signed into law in August of 1935. The Social Security Act created Social Security a federal safety net for elderly, unemployed, and disadvantaged Americans. President Truman saw that law as a good beginning, but that it needed to be expanded to provide economic security for many not eligible for or covered by the then existing social security system. And secondly, that the benefits needed to be increased to actually accomplish the security the law was meant to provide. Truman continued in his speech. We should now extend unemployment compensation, old age benefits, and survivors' benefits to millions who are not now protected. We should also raise the level of benefits. Next, he proposed the enactment of legislation to create a national health insurance program. Back to his speech. The greatest gap in our Social Security structure is the lack of adequate provision for the nation's health. Most of our people cannot afford to pay for the care they need. I have often and strongly urged that this condition demands a national health program. The heart of the program must be a national system of payment for medical care based on well-tried insurance principles. Our ultimate aim must be a comprehensive insurance system to protect all our people equally against insecurity and ill health. Back in 1945, a mere seven months into his presidency as part of his Fair Deal program proposals for his domestic agenda, President Truman had proposed a universal national health insurance program. In his remarks to Congress at that time, he declared, quote, Millions of our citizens do not now have protection or security against the economic effects of sickness. The time has arrived for action to help them attain that opportunity and that protection. 
the tale of how Truman's proposal for universal national health insurance, first set forth in 1945, became an issue of great contention as hearings were held and it was debated in the Senate is beyond the scope of this class. But suffice it to say that it was against that background that Harry Truman was again proposing a national health insurance plan in 1948, an election year. In 1945, Senate Republicans, led by Senator Robert A. Taft of Ohio, a staunch conservative and consistent opponent of federal social welfare programs, who had his eyes set on the 1948 Republican nomination for the presidency, sought to derail the proposal as socialized medicine. Generally speaking, this was consistent with Taft's ongoing opposition to government spending on social welfare programs, which had been part of Roosevelt's New Deal agenda. Obviously, Truman had not been able to get legislation passed to accomplish this goal or proposal. And here was President Truman again in 1948, as I stated, an election year, urging the Congress to pass such a plan. The first federal program of national health insurance was the legislation enacting Medicare and Medicaid, which was passed by the Congress in 1965 and signed into law by then President Lyndon B. Johnson in the auditorium of the Harry S. Truman Library and Museum in Independence on July 30th of that year, that's 1965 with former President Truman seated immediately to his left. And there you see a picture of that signing ceremony. LBJ had traveled to the Show Me State to sign the Medicare Act into law and to praise the 81-year-old Truman, who, as Johnson drawled in his thick Texas accent, was the real daddy of Medicare. Medicare and Medicaid, which was passed into law in 1965, had its roots in Truman's proposals in 1945, 1948, and throughout his presidency that we needed a system of universal national health insurance. Obviously, the words that I stated just a minute ago from both Truman and from Robert Taft are words that we have heard repeated in the last few years in the debate over Obamacare and in the continuing discussion about a system of national health insurance understand the history of these things, or to understand the present position on these things, one must almost go back and study the history behind them. In any event, uh, sometimes it takes a long time for ideas to actually bear fruit. Next, Truman addressed the issue of education in the nation. He stated, another fundamental aim of our democracy is to provide an adequate education for every person. Our educational system face, systems face a financial crisis. There are millions of children who do not have adequate schoolhouses or enough teachers for a good elementary or secondary education. If there are educational inadequacies in any state, the whole nation suffers. The federal government has a responsibility for, for, for providing financial aid to meet this crisis. He continued. In addition, we must make possible greater equality of opportunity for, to all our citizens for education. Only by doing so can we ensure that our citizens will be capable of understanding and sharing the responsibilities of democracy. So here was President Truman recognizing that a reasonably well-educated populace was really one of the requirements of a well-functioning democracy, an issue that we continue to confront uh, down to this day, and we're hearing more and more about those uh, inequalities uh, in the public marketplace today. Truman next proposed the creation of a separate department to deal with the issues of health, education, and security, the head of which department would become a cabinet level position. I'll just comment that it wasn't until 1953 that the Department of Health, Health, Education, and Welfare was created and a cabinet position came into being to be occupied by the secretary of that new agency. 
But Truman had staked out a position on this matter, which of course the Republican 80th Congress would oppose in an election year. Here's what Truman said. I think I jumped over that. I don't think I have a slide on that. The government's progress for health, education, and security are of such great importance to our democracy that we should now establish an executive department for their administration. He next addressed the issue of housing. Within the next decade, we must see that every American family has a decent home. As an immediate step, we need the long range housing program, which I have recommended on many occasions to this Congress. This should include financial aids designed to yield more housing at lower prices. It should provide public housing for low income families and vigorous development of new techniques to lower the cost of building. Until we can overcome the present drastic housing shortage, we must extend and strengthen rent control. Next, he spoke pretty positively about the return of the veterans to the United States at the end of the war and what had been done with respect to veterans, which was mainly sort of a pat on the back as to what had been done. There were no real new proposals with regard to veterans in that other than how they might have been impacted, impacted by proposals in the housing area. You might note that each of the goals and groups that would be benefited or offended by Truman's proposals represented potential voters in the upcoming election. And to the extent a specific group would be benefited if a proposal affecting them was adopted, Truman stood, stood to gain politically. Many of those offended by Truman's proposals were in the conservative wing of the Republican Party, who weren't going to support or vote for Truman anyway, but included in a group put off by Truman's proposals were Southern Democrats, which the politics of 1948 memorandum said could be safely ignored from a political standpoint, if you recall our discussion of that earlier. Truman moves next to his third goal, which was to conserve and use our natural resources so that they can contribute most effectively to the welfare of our people. Note how the discussion of this goal, as we go through that a little bit, is primarily directed to agricultural interests and voters in the Western part of the nation. Remember in the politics of 1948 memorandum, how winning the vote of farmers and of voters in the West was stressed as important politically in Truman's campaign efforts. President Truman begins his discussion of this goal by acknowledging the nature and extent of the natural resources of the country. He then recognizes the connection between the conservation of those resources and the strength of the nation. He scolds the nation for not taking appropriate steps to keep from destroying our natural resources and says, quote, we must vigorously defend our natural wealth against those who would misuse it for selfish gain. He then asserts specific actions to accomplish this goal. We need knowledge of our mineral resources and must intensify our efforts to develop new supplies and to acquire stockpiles of scarce materials. We need to protect and restore our land, public and private, through combating erosion and rebuilding the fertility of the soil. We must expand our reclamation program to bring millions of acres of arid land into production and to improve water supplies for additional millions of acres. This will provide new opportunities for veterans and others, particularly in the West and aid in providing a rising living standard for a growing population. We must protect and restore our forests by sustained yield forestry and by planting new trees in areas now slashed and barren. We must continue to erect multiple purpose dams on our great rivers, not only to reclaim land, but also to prevent floods to extend our inland waterways 
and to provide hydroelectric power. Additional power, public and private, is needed to raise the ceilings now imposed by power shortages on industrial and agricultural development. We should achieve the wise use of resources through the integrated development of our Great River Basin. We can learn much from our Tennessee Valley experience. We should no longer delay in applying the lessons of that vast undertaking to our Great River Basins. Keep in mind that there was a fairly significant portion of our country, particularly rural and away from cities areas, that still did not have electric power even after World War II. And so the extension of electric power to all places in the United States was a high and mighty goal that was really intended to improve the living standards of people out in rural areas. Truman uh, next moves on to his fourth and last domestic agenda goal, to lift the standard of living for all our people by strengthening our economic system and sharing more broadly among our people the goods we produce. Under this goal, President Truman starts out reciting the good news of the American economy compared with where it was 10 years earlier when we were still in the Depression. And he recognizes the income improvements which had been realized by farmers, businessmen, and wage earners in that intervening 10 years. Going forward, he struck what was probably an unrealistic expectation when he said, we may not be able to expand as rapidly in the next decade as in the last, because we are now starting from full employment and very high production but we can increase our annual output by at least one third above the present level. We can lift our standard of living to nearly double what it was 10 years ago. If we distribute those gains properly, we can go far towards stamping out poverty in our generation. Again, he highlighted farmers and proposed certain measures with the goal of increasing the standard of living of farmers to match those of city dwellers. In that respect, he recommended continuing price supports to farm commodities and the modernization of the current support program. He recommended strengthening crop insurance and extending its benefits to protect farmers against the hazards unique to farming, such as the weather. As previously mentioned, he recommended that the rural electrification program move forward to bring electricity to everyone on the farm. He recommended that the federal government aid and encourage farmers to conserve their soil resources and restore the fertility of their land. Next, he turned to the industrial capacity of the United States. He recommended strengthening the U.S. economic system by enlarging our industrial capacity, utilizing the free enterprise system to accomplish this. He recommended the encouragement of competition within the free enterprise system and the breakup of concentrated economic power and monopolies through the enforcement of existing antitrust laws. One of the unintended consequences of what was done during World War II was the granting of government contracts typically to larger business organizations because they had the ability to provide larger quantities of things. And as a result of that, something Truman wanted to see, which didn't really happen with the war effort, was to provide more opportunity to smaller businesses to provide for government need. So the war actually exacerbated the problem of large versus small. And here Truman is saying, I recognize what's happened here. I want us to take steps as a government to sort of break up monopolistic enterprises that have developed and create more opportunities for smaller businesses. Next, he turned to the wage earner by first recognizing the importance of the well-being of wage earners. He recommended raising the federal minimum wage from 40 cents per hour to 70 cents, 5 cents per hour. Now to us today, that sounds pretty niggling, but the fact of the matter is, from a percentage standpoint, that's a pretty whopping increase 
in the minimum wage to jump from 40 cents an hour to 75 cents per hour. On the organized labor front, he recognized the importance of collective bargaining to set wage scales and stated that workers' income should increase at a rate consistent with the maintenance of sound price, meaning price of products, profit, profit levels for the business, and wage relationships, and with increases of productivity. He mentioned the Labor Management Relations Act of 1947, commonly known as the Taft-Hartley Act, a federal law that restricted the activities and power of labor unions, which the Republican Congress had passed over his veto. He expressed his continued opposition to that law, but recognized it as the law of the land and his obligation as president for its enforcement as long as it remained the law. Note again the name Taft on the common title to this legislation. This is the same Republican Senator Robert Taft of Ohio who was notoriously anti-union in his politics and, and who was looking to the presidential, Republic, presidential nomination of the Republican Party in 1948. He was perhaps Truman's leading nemesis, or at least one of them, in the 80th Congress. Truman urged wisdom and restraint on the part of both labor and management in wage negotiations and warned of the danger to the economic well being of the country of work stoppages. Remember that Harry Truman was, generally speaking, supportive of organized labor, and organized labor at that time was an important piece of the Democratic Party puzzle. But remember as well that Truman during his first term was confronted with potentially destructive labor actions by a multitude of labor unions going on strike. Perhaps most prominently a strike by railroad workers in May of 1946, when President Truman threatened to seize the railroads and draft the rail workers into the army from which they couldn't strike without committing treason. Fortunately, as we talked about in a previous class in a, different, in a different series, the strike got settled at the last moment, and as 1948 dawned, organized labor was once again more favorably inclined to be supportive of Truman, to a great extent because of his veto of the Taft-Hartley bill late in 1947. So, from the political standpoint of attracting organized labor, back to uh, President Truman and away from Henry Wallace, which is where they'd sort of been leaning. Pres uh, President Truman's veto of the Taft-Hartley bill in 1947 and his general pro-labor stance in his State of the Union helped move leaders of organized labor away from Wallace and back to his camp. Another important factor in the movement of organized labor leaders away from Wallace and in Truman's direction was the general distrust of communism that had developed among the American populace and the resistance of most leaders of organized labor to attempts by communists or their sympathizers to gain control of various labor organizations. Truman then turned to his fifth goal and the only one not concerned with domestic affairs. His fifth goal was to achieve world peace based on principles of freedom and justice and the equality of all nations. Remember, Truman is giving his speech at a time when it is not yet three years that have passed since the end of World War II, both in Europe, which happened in May of 1945, and in the Pacific, which happened in August of 1945. So it's not yet three full years since that war came to an end. And the fact of that, that war and its aftermath was surely still present in the short-term memory of the American people. Here, President Truman cemented the internationalist policies he, he had been pursuing since shortly after the war in Europe had ended and the Potsdam Conference had taken place. In March of 1947, he had announced the policy of containment, which became known as the Truman Doctrine. The Truman administration's policy 
toward the only remaining superpower in the world, the USSR, was to seek peace through a policy of strength and resistance to Soviet expansionism in Europe. In this speech, you can see his rejection of the notion that the United States should now withdraw into itself consistent with the ideas of the isolationists and leave the countries of Europe to fend for themselves in the face of Soviet aggression, which was essentially the position of some conservative Republicans and interestingly enough, mainly the position of Henry Wallace and his supporters. Truman begins, by, uh, Tr Truman begins his discussion of how to accomplish this goal by acknowledging certain things America has learned as a result of World Wars I and II. He says, twice within our generation, world wars have taught us that we cannot isolate ourselves from the rest of the world. We have learned that the loss of freedom and independence anywhere in the world translates to a loss of freedom in the U.S. and the insecurity of the U.S. of the U.S. and all free nations. We have learned that a healthy world economy is essential for world peace and economic distress in those distressed countries creates evils which spread beyond the boundaries of the economically distressed nations. Having recognized and discovered these three truths, he asserts that the U.S. is pursuing policies which are designed to help create a peaceful and prosperous world, some specific ones that he mentioned. Supporting the United Nations, taking steps toward world economic recovery and the revival of world trade. Maintaining a strong military force to resist those opposed to the ideals of a peaceful world. The passage of the National Security Act by the Congress at its last session. The National Security Act of 1947 mandated a major reorganization of the foreign policy and military establishments of the U.S. government. The act created many of the institutions that presidents found useful when formulating and implementing foreign policy, including the National Security Council, the NSC. The act also established the Central Intelligence Agency, the CIA, which grew out of World War II era, the, the World War II era Office of Strategic uh, uh, services, and other small post-war intelligence organizations. That law also caused far-reaching changes in the military establishment. The War Department and the Navy Department merged into a single Department of Defense under the Secretary of Defense, who also directed the newly created Department of the Air Force. However, each of the three branches maintained their own service secretary. A year or so later in 1949, the act was amended to give the Secretary of Defense, Defense more power over the individual services and their secretary. <clears throat> A related matter which Truman proposed to the Congress and which he considered to be very important was universal military training, the return to conscription a return of the draft. As early as October 1945, Truman had presented to a joint session of the Congress a proposal for universal military training. Under that proposal, all males graduating, graduating high school or, or turning 18 would sign up for one year of compulsory training. After that, the men would be signed up for six years of reserve service. Here, Truman is once again lifting up this proposal for the Congress's action. Truman's, Truman next listed international activities which the United States is, uh, is engaged in, which are intended to create lasting peaceful relationships among nations. Among these, the substantial aid to Greece and Turkey to protect their governments and assist them in resisting insurgencies supported by outside interests, read the Soviet Union. 
Truman next acknowledged that thousands of persons displaced by World War II were still living in camps overseas as refugees. He recommended that they should be allowed early entry into the United States and urged Congress to pass legislation so that the U.S. can do its share to care for homeless and suffering refugees, regardless of their faith. With regard to the reconstruction of the world economy and the world trading system, he said, we are moving toward our goal. Well, see, I, I'm over that. We are moving toward our goal of world peace in many ways. But the most important efforts which we are now making are those which support world economic reconstruction. We are seeking to restore the world trading system, which was shattered by the war, and to remedy the economic paralysis which grips many countries. <clears throat> To restore world trade, we have recently taken the lead in bringing about the greatest reduction of world tariffs that the world has ever seen. The extension of the provisions of the Reciprocal Trade Agreements Act, which made this achievement possible, is of extreme importance. We must also go on to support the international trade organization through which we hope to obtain worldwide agreement on a code of fair conduct in international trade. I think those words are, parenthetically speaking, I think those words stand as extremely important position that Truman was taking about the importance to our country and the rest of the world in the reduction of tariffs between nations and the encouragement of world trade towards world peace, which was the goal here he was talking about. So I'll leave those comments aside, but I think they resonate in the world that we live in today. And so you can see Harry Truman's position on that particular matter. Truman next proceeded to discuss the importance to world peace of the proposed European Recovery Program, AKA the Marshall Plan, which at that time was pending before the Congress and to encourage its passage. He said, our present major effort towards economic reconstruction is to support the program for recovery developed by the countries of Europe. In my recent message to the Congress, I outlined the reasons why it is wise and necessary for the United States to extend this support. I want to reaffirm Hmm. I guess I skipped something there. I want to reaffirm my belief in the soundness and the promise of this proposal. When the European economy is strengthened, the product of its industry will be a benefit to many other areas of economic distress. The ability of free men to overcome hunger and despair will be a moral stimulus to the whole world, or entire world, he said. We intend to work also with other nations in achieving world economic recovery. We shall continue our cooperation with the nations of, Western, of the Western Hemisphere. A special program of assistance to China to provide urgent relief, needs, urgent relief needs and to speed reconstruction will be submitted to the Congress. Unfortunately, not all governments share the hope of the people of the United States that economic reconstruction in many areas of the world can be achieved through cooperative effort among nations. In spite of these differences, we will go forward with our efforts to overcome economic paralysis. No nation by itself can carry these programs to success. They depend upon the cooperative and honest efforts of all participating countries. Yet the leadership is inevitably ours. I consider it of the highest importance that the Congress should authorize support for the European Recovery Program, the Marshall Plan, for the period from April the 1st, 1948 to June 30th, 1952, with an initial amount for the first 15 months 
of $6.8 billion. I urge the Congress to act promptly on this vital measure of our foreign policy, on this decisive contribution to world peace. He then gave a sort of summation to what he had to say and what he had done and was proposing to do to meet this fifth goal. We are following a sound, constructive, and practical course in carrying out our determination to meet this fifth goal. We are seeking to achieve peace. We are fighting poverty, hunger, and suffering. This leads to peace, not war. We are building toward a world where all nations, large and small alike, may live free, free, free from fear of aggression. This leads to peace, not war. Above all else, we are striving to achieve a concord among the peoples of the world based upon the dignity of the individual and the brotherhood of man. This leads to peace, not war. Finally, he turns to an issue which he believes potentially transcends and couldn't limit the nation's ability to pursue the goals already set out in his speech. In this regard, he says, as we enter the new year, we must surmount one major problem which affects all our goals. This is the problem of inflation. After reciting some of the facts related to the issue of inflation and what it does to the nation's economy, he says, we must deal effectively and at once with the high cost of living. We must stop the spiral of inflation. This was the reiteration of points made in his address to Congress in November of 1947 regarding inflation and housing. <clears throat> In that speech, he had proposed rent and uh, transportation price controls and credit controls and the reintroduction of mandatory wage and price controls, as had been in effect during the war but had been allowed to expire. Somewhat confusing to me as a non-economist under this particular topic, Truman proposed some revisions to the tax law as being relevant to fighting inflation. What he proposed was, he said, revenue neutral. He proposed that tax revenues remain constant, but that every taxpayer receive a tax credit of $40 per year beginning January the 1st, 1948, with an additional $40 tax credit for each dependent. <clears throat> on the other hand, he proposed increasing the tax on corporate profits to make up for the loss of revenue resulting from the $40 tax credit proposal. I'm not sure how that would have any impact upon inflation, but that's how he justified its tax cut for the, for the potential voting taxpayer and the tax increases for the non-voting corporation. Perhaps this was the most political of proposals contained in his speech, says the cynic in me. Truman ended his State of the Union address for 1948 with these words. Let us keep ever before us our high purposes. We are determined that every citizen of this nation shall have an equal right and an equal opportunity to grow in wisdom and in stature and to take his place in the control of his nation's destiny. We are determined that the productive resources of this nation shall be used wisely and fully for the benefit of all. We are determined that the democratic faith of our people and the strength of our resources shall contribute their full share, full share to the attainment of enduring peace in the world. It is our faith in human dignity that underlies these fundamentals, under, under, underlies these purposes. It is this faith that keeps us a strong and vital people. This is a time to remind ourselves of these fundamentals. For today, the whole world looks to us for leadership. This is the hour to rededicate ourselves to the faith in mankind that makes us strong. 
This is the hour to rededicate ourselves to the faith in God that gives us confidence as we face the challenges of the years ahead. So by all accounts, the campaign for the presidency in 1948, at least President Truman's campaign, was on. And what a campaign and election it turned out to be. You have but to look at the politics of 1948 memorandum, Truman's State of the Union address, and his special message to the Congress on Civil Rights in February 1948 to identify the issues and proposals Truman thought important and the specific positions that President Truman was taking on those issues. Now, this is a place for a break if you'd like to take one and for us to pause just briefly, but I'm anxious for us to move forward and talk about the Republican candidates on their side of this process. And so I really don't want to take very long in taking a break. So Lori, I'm going to leave that screen sharing thing up there on the off chance that it won't go to sleep on me. Sure. So uh, if people want to ask a question or make a comment quickly, uh, I'm, open to, I'm open to that now, or you need to take a break yourself. If you need to unmute yourself, remember you can do that to ask your question or you can uh, ask me to help you in the chat box. I have a comment. Uh, last week we talked about the Buffalo Soldiers and um, once we got off the class, my husband asked me, he said, do you know why they call them the Buffalo Soldiers? And I said, no. And he said it was because uh, of the black men's snappy hair that were like, you know, the head of a buffalo, the nappy head of a buffalo. Just sharing that information, I'd never heard that before. Well, I understand the Buffalo Soldiers had their uh, roots in existence well before World War II. The reason, uh, I, don't, I have never heard that. Uh, the reason that they're so important is they were so respected within the military and within the black community. So David Wyatt's absolutely key to what Truman did is their legacy of competence and service to the country as soldiers was par excellence. And it was his primary uh, exhibit A when he pointed to what would happen if he integrated the military. And that's why they continue to be so proud and the military continues to be so proud of them because that was one of the uh, probably unexpected social experiments in the 1880s on that uh, absolutely uh, uh, produced fruit. Other questions or comments before we move on? Yeah, I, I just to comment, I'm reading right now a McCullough's book. I'm about two years behind you. We just got through the election of 46. But just the detail, I didn't realize uh, that the Taft you're talking about was also the son of William Howard Taft, the former president. I We're thought that, about that here in a little bit. Okay. Good Just segue. Interesting detail. Right. Anybody else? Just quickly before we move on. Okay, Lori, let's go ahead. I'll pick it up here. Okay, everybody's back on mute. Thank you. So let's move now to the topic, the heading I have here, I'm calling it Republican Candidates. So let's turn next to the leading cast of characters on the Republican side of the contest uh, that were in the conversation for the Republican nomination to the presidency. We've already discussed the issues confronting Truman in obtaining the nomination of the Democratic Party as its standard bearer for the presidency in 1948. But the bottom line was that once the dump Truman draft Eisenhower boomlet fizzled out, which really wasn't until right before the convention in July. 
Truman did not really face serious challenges to the party's nomination and in fact emerged from the Democratic National Convention in Philadelphia in July after the first ballot, of, uh, first round of balloting with the nomination in hand. To the extent that Truman did or said things on the issues between January and July of 1948, prior to receiving the Democratic nomination, politically, what he did or said was pointed towards the general election campaign with the assumption, at least according to the politics of 1948 memo, that Tom Dewey would be his Republican opponent. We'll discuss in some detail the major actions President Truman took during 1948 or the major events of 1948 that imposed themselves upon, upon President Truman prior to the election in November. Suffice it to say, those actions, when we talk about that in a subsequent class, were significant and historic. Andrew Bush writes in his, uh, in his book, the main opposition to Truman in November would come not from Wallace or Thurman, but from the Republicans, who had to choose from among a broad and not undistinguished field of aspirants. The ultimate nominee for the Republican Party wasn't certain as a, at the beginning of 1948. In that regard, as I just mentioned, the Truman campaign, or at least the authors of the politics of 1948 memorandum, assumed that the nominee would be Thomas Dewey. As we, knew, as we know, that assumption ended up being correct. At the head of the pack of Republican hopefuls in 1947 and early 1948, stood Thomas E. Dewey, governor of New York, Robert A. Taft, senator from Ohio, and Harold Stassen, former governor of Minnesota. Others who either had or had had presidential aspirations or support, uh, supporters promoting their candidacy were Michigan Senator Arthur Vandenberg and California Governor Earl Warren a dark horse possibility whose name was mentioned from time to time in 1947 and 1948 was General Douglas MacArthur, who at the time was acting as a military governor of occupied Japan. Interestingly, in late 1947 and early 1948, there were those in the Republican Party who hoped to draft Dwight Eisenhower as a Republican nominee. This was chronologically prior to the time certain members of the Democratic Party who wanted to dump Truman had convinced themselves that Eisenhower would accept a draft as the nominee of the Democratic Party in Truman's place. So there were those in both major parties who, at one time or another, thought they could convince Eisenhower to accept, accept a draft as their party's nominee. As we know, Eisenhower rejected both parties' attempts to entice him to be interest, interested in their nomination. So there's really nothing to talk about with substance regarding an Eisenhower candidacy. It's just interesting to be aware that both of the major political parties expressed interest in having General Eisenhower serve as a standard bearer of their party without Eisenhower ever indicating whether he considered himself a member or potential member of their respective party. Regarding MacArthur, he had signaled his willingness to be drafted as a party nominee when he cabled to those from Wisconsin who were supporting him in typical MacArthur fashion, and these are MacArthur's words, in the labyrinth of destiny's pattern, there can be no greater satisfaction than such as comes from the confidence reflected in the selection by one's neighbors for public service. MacArthur declined to leave Tokyo to come to the U.S. to campaign, and in fact, he had not been back to the mainland United States for several years. He was afraid that if he pushed all out for the nomination, he would lose face in Japan, as the Japanese were actually looking to him for leadership in restoring uh, things in Japan. The bottom line was that MacArthur's campaign never was a serious one, and the possibility of his becoming the nominee would have been strictly as a compromise candidate in the event of a deadlock convention, which did not really come to pass. California Governor Earl Warren 
was very popular in his home state of California. But his campaign, such as it was, never really took off nationally. As we will see, Earl Warren became the Republican nominee for the vice, president, vice presidency once Dewey got the nomination. Senator Arthur Vandenberg, who's the gentleman with his hand raised there in that picture, was a very interesting character and probably forfeited any possibility of getting the Republican nomination when he worked closely with President Truman to construct a bipartisan post-war policy of the United States with regard to foreign affairs. He had gone with President Truman as a Republican re representative to Potsdam as part of the U.S. delegation to the Big Three meeting there that occurred in July and August of 1945. In fact, as the debate on the Marshall Plan proceeded in early 1948, Vandenberg, as an important senator and a Republican, was commonly considered with respect to the Marshall Plan, the most important man in Congress, in Washington, and probably in the world. Lawrence J. Haas, who is an award-winning journalist, wrote a book which was released in 2016 about this relationship entitled, Harry and Arthur, Truman Vandenberg and the Partnership that Created the Free World. In his book, Haas describes how, through the close collaboration of Truman and Vandenberg, the United States created the United Nations to, to replace the League of Nations, pursued the Truman Doctrine, the policy of containment, to defend freedom from communist threat, launched the Marshall Plan to rescue Western Europe's economy from the devastation of war, and established NATO to defend Western Europe. The summary of this book reads, with Franklin Roosevelt's death in April of 1945, Vice President Harry Truman and, Re and Senator Arthur Vandenberg, the Republican leader on foreign policy, inherited a world in turmoil. With Europe flattened and the Soviets emerging as America's new adversary, Truman and Vanderbilt, Vanderberg built a tight partnership with one another to address the challenges at hand. Working in strong bipartisan fashion at a bitterly partisan time, they crafted a dra dramatic new foreign policy through which the United States stepped boldly onto the world stage for the first time in its history to protect its friends, confront its enemies, and promote freedom. These two men, unlikely partners by way of personality and style, transformed the United States from a reluctant global giant to a self-confident leader. From a nation that typically turned inward after war to one that remained engaged to shape the post-war landscape. And from a nation with no real military establishment to one that now spends more on defense than the next dozen nations combined. Vandenberg was quoted as saying he could not imagine himself getting on the stump and blasting Harry Truman, or imagine Harry Truman getting on the stump and blasting him. As the campaign for the nomination began, Vandenberg de declared publicly that he thought he could best serve the country by, by completing his present term in the Senate and asked the leaders of the Michigan Republican Party not to advance him as a favorite son. He wanted to leave himself free to maneuver in the Senate to promote Truman's foreign policy goals and to try to influence those foreign policy goals in a way that he considered to be constructive. So think about that in the world that we live in today. Here we had the leader of the Republican Party in the Senate the chair of the Foreign Relations Committee, I believe it was, working closely and hand in glove with President Truman to craft the policy of containment and to take steps leading to the rebuilding of Western Europe and our alliance with our Western allies. Anyway, with the discounting of those potential people whose names are important historically, uh, that leaves us with the top three contenders for the nomination men who truly had the ambition and potential and potential support 
to seek and obtain the Republican nomination for the presidency. Tom Dewey, governor of New York, Robert Taft, senator from Ohio, and Harold Stassen, former governor of Minnesota. So who were these three men and what were their bona fides? So let's talk about Tom Dewey, first of all. Dewey was born in a small town in Michigan in March of 1902. His father was the editor of a locally weekly paper, local weekly paper and chairman of the county GOP committee. His paternal grandfather assisted in founding the National Republican Party in 1856. As a result, Dewey was a lifelong Republican, and in the 1920s and 30s, he was a party worker in New York City, City <clears throat> eventually rising to become chair of the New York Young Republican Club in 1931. When asked in 1946 why he was a Republican, Dewey replied, quote, I believe that the Republican Party is the best instrument for bringing sound government into the hands of competent men and by this means preserving our liberties. But there is another reason why I am a Republican. I was born one. Young Tom Dewey had a really good baritone singing voice and earned money while at the University of Michigan singing in an Ann Arbor Methodist church choir. He briefly considered a career as a professional singer, but decided against it after a temporary throat ailment convinced him that such a career would be risky. So instead of pursuing a career as a professional singer, he then decided to pursue a career as a lawyer. Harvard Law rejected his application, but he was accepted into Columbia Law School in New York, where he completed a scheduled three years of law school in just two years. And by virtue of that fortuitous event, that is that he went to law school in New York, it set him up for residency and political career in that city and in that state. He graduated in 1925 from Columbia Law School and joined a law firm in New York City. In 1931, Dewey was appointed to fill a position in the office of the U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of New York. Remember that in 1931, Herbert Hoover was the president, Roosevelt was not yet elected, and we had a Republican administration federally. Therefore, the U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of New York was a Republican appointee. Anyway, the U.S. Attorney there, a man named George Z. Medley, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, said of Dewey, quote, I dropped him in the cold water and let him swim out. He made a darn good job of it, so good a job that I relieved him of some of the administrative work and turned him loose on the racketeering field. Medley resigned after Herbert Hoover's defeat in 1932. Dewey, only 31 at the time, was designated as the interim U.S. attorney as Medley's successor. While serving in that capacity, Dewey took up the prosecution of the notorious mobster and bootlegger, I love these guys' names, Irving Waxy Gordon. In the course of nine days, Dewey, who famously told the jury, quote, gentlemen, there will be a lot of dead men mentioned during this case. Dewey presented 900 pieces of evidence and 131 witnesses. In 1930, Waxy had tendered just $10.76 to the Internal Revenue Service as his tax obligation. I'll repeat that. Waxy only paid $10.76 in, te in taxes. Dewey demonstrated by the evidence that Waxy had actually earned $1,427,531 in income in the year 1930. 51 minutes after they began deliberating, the jury convicted Waxy Gordon on all four counts of tax evasion. In addition, the judge fined Waxy $80,000 and sentenced him to 10 years in prison, in the federal prison in Atlanta. 
the legend of Tom Dewey, Gotham's fearless, incorruptible, racket-busting prosecutor, was thus born. Republican Dewey left the US, U.S. Attorney's Office following Democrat FDR's election in 1932 and inauguration in early 1933. He was in private practice for a short while when, after complaints about the then current Manhattan District Attorney surplus in the mishandling of investigations into the numbers racket and bail bond irregularities, Dewey was appointed a special prosecutor to take over the matter. <clears throat> Dewey ran a tight ship and enlisted the public's help and support in fighting rampant criminal conditions in New York. Now keep in mind that we're still in the period of time that had been influenced criminally by the Depression and by Prohibition. If you think about it, the rise of gangsterism in the United States roughly paralleled the period of time of Prohibition. In 1937, Dewey ran and was elected as Manhattan District Attorney by an overwhelming majority. In a relatively short period of time, Dewey's record in fighting crime was quite amazing. Convicted of criminal behavior under Dewey were former New York Stock Exchange head Richard, the voice of Wall Street, Whitney. West Harlem Tammany leader, Jimmy Hines. Tammany Hall, as you'll recall, was the political system that ran New York City. And Vice King, Charles Lucky Luciano. According to David Pietruska in his book about 1948 and Harry Tr Truman's improbable victory, so feared was this young crusader that in August 1939, Vicious Murder, Inc. chieftain Louis Lucky Buckalter dramatically surrendered to federal authorities through an equally dramatic intermediary, Broadway gossip columnist Walter Winchell, rather than face Dewey's wrath on the state level. And so feared that numbers kingpin and former beer baron Arthur Dutch Schultz Legenheimer broke unwritten mob rules and plotted to assassinate Dewey. The plan short-circuited when Schultz's nervous gangland allies prudently rubbed him out instead, avoiding the prosecution. In 1938, seeing himself destined for greater things, Dewey challenged the incumbent governor of New York for the governorship and fell just short of defeating him. Instead of being humbled at all by the defeat, he became certain of his inevitable political success, raising the stakes to the presidency his, his, itself. His biggest drawback seems to be his confidence in himself, his arrogance and ego. In public, David Brinkley, who all of you remember, David Brinkley would later observe about Dewey, Dewey came across as pompous and cold, and for good reason. He was both. Others thought it misleading to focus merely upon his public persona. Helen Porter Simpson, the wife of Manhattan's liberal GOP chairman, Kenneth F. Simpson, famously observed, listen to this carefully, you really have to know Tom Dewey well in order to dislike him. According to Chicago isolationist Sterling Morton's summary, Dewey was a self-made man who worshiped his creator. I paused for chuckles, but you're all muted, so I can't hear them. And so Tom Dewey voluntarily retired from the district attorneyship and embarked upon a new mission to slay his biggest dragon of all, the very biggest dragon, period, Franklin. Delano Roosevelt. In 1939, December, Dewey announced his candidacy for the presidency. He was but 37 years of age. FDR's Secretary of the Interior, Harold Ickes, snarkily remarked 
that Dewey, quote, had thrown his diaper into the political ring, close quote. Ultimately, Wendell Wilkie, a New York lawyer, threw his hat in the Republican nomination ring as an interventionist in foreign matters and rose in the polls while Dewey's uh, numbers fell. Wilkie ultimately became the uh, Rep Republican nominee on the sixth ballot at the 1940 National Convention. Seemingly unfazed by this turn of events, Dewey turned his eyes to the New York governorship where he ran in 1942 and handily won victory over the Democratic nominee. Following his election, he famously said to the voters, for my part, let me say right now that I shall devote the next four years exclusively to the service of the people of the state of New York. That's what he said in 1942. The next four years I will devote exclusively to the service of the people of the state of New York. In 1944, his promise to the uh, New York voters notwithstanding, Dewey once again pursued the Republican nomination for the presidency. This time the field was relatively clear of serious challengers and he gained the nomination to run against the slate of FDR and Harry Truman. Without going into uh, the details of Dewey's 1944 presidential campaign, suffice it to say that he ran a relatively assertive and aggressive campaign against the FDR Truman ticket. But as the story I'm about to relate indicates, there were still some things that were off limits for use in his campaign. The following story I'm going to relate to you is taken from a story that appeared in the Washington Post in August of 1981, written by journalist Thomas O'Toole. I'm quoting now from that article. When New York Governor Thomas E. Dewey discovered that the United States, <clears throat> pardon me, had broken the Japanese diplomatic codes and might have had prior knowledge of the 1941 sneak attack at Pearl Harbor, he was contacted secretly by Army Chief of Staff General George C. Marshall. Marshall asked Dewey not to reveal the secret during the 1944 presidential election campaign between Dewey, the Republican candidate, and President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, because the Japanese were still using the same codes at the height of the Pacific War. Marshall sent an army intelligence officer in civilian clothes to meet secretly with Governor Dewey three times and spoke by telephone once with Dewey to persuade him that the war effort would be seriously endangered if Dewey disclosed U.S. knowledge of the codes. While Dewey never revealed the secret, he remained convinced that Roosevelt had prior knowledge of the Pearl Harbor attack after which the United States entered World War II and that Roosevelt had ordered Marshall to get Dewey to keep his mouth shut during the campaign. This is me, not in, I think this is in the article actually. Dewey said privately to one of his advisors, I'm gonna keep quiet, but I think Roosevelt ought to be impeached, not reelected. In any event, he kept quiet. Back to the article. In a separate document made public by the NSA, William F. Friedman, head crypto cryptographer for the Army in World War II said, the Army never knew how Dewey found out about the breaking of the Japanese codes or who in the federal government might have told him one of the war's best kept secrets. Friedman also insisted, and this is important, Friedman also insisted that the diplomatic cables contained nothing that hinted at the attack on Pearl Harbor because the Japanese military command, military command had never told the Japanese foreign office about plans for the attack. The premier of the country, this is quoting Friedman here, the premier of the country and his minister of war were not notified of the impending attack on Pearl Harbor by their own high command. At the time of the attack, the only codes we had broken were the diplomatic codes which did not have anything in them about the attack. To me, 
a breathtaking story about the U.S. effort in World War II and Tom Dewey's um, patriotism in agreeing not to reveal what he knew that might have had a serious impact on the election in 1944. You can still find conspiracy theories out there that contend that Roosevelt knew about the, the pending attack and, and are consistent with what Dewey thought he knew. But this, to me at least, is direct information coming from the head of the cryptography unit in the Army saying what we knew and didn't know. And this is information that came out decades later. Anyway, when the 1944 election results were in, FDR ended up with 53.8% of the vote and an electoral college landslide of 443 to 92. Dewey ran again for New York governor in 1946 and, ran handle, and won handily for a second term. Now it was 1947, turning into 1948, and the odds of a Republican victory against the fracturing Democratic Party and their likely nominee, Thomas, or Harry Truman, appeared good. So the nomination was once again, in Tom Dewey's very ambitious eyes, worth having. The question was, could he change? Could he make himself warm, human, and above, above all electable beyond the governorship in Albany? Along those lines, in March of 1948, reporters of New York City put on a skit at their annual Inner Circle, er, Inner Circle parody show entitled vote in a smoke-filled room. The journalist portraying Tom Dewey in the skit sang a song with these lyrics. I'll be different if I'm the nominee. I'll be different, not like I used to be. I'll be so real, get sex appeal, pleasant and sweet. I'll undo the New Deal. I'll learn to laugh, not like Bob Tapp, if I'm the nominee. So you can see Tom Dewey's personality and persona was well known in the public arena. And the question was whether Dewey could change that persona either during the race for the nomination of the Republican Party or later on once he got nominated during the general election. So Dewey was in the campaign for the nomination for the presidency in 1948. And as I just improbbed, could he change? Could he make himself warm, human, and above all, electable beyond Albany? So who was behind door number two? Robert A. Taft. <clears throat> David Pietruza begins his chapter on Robert Taft with these words. No man was ever born to be president of the United States of America more than U.S. Senator Robert Alfonso Taft, dash, or less end of that quote. Taft was born in September of 1889 in Cincinnati, Ohio. As Michael alerted us to, his father was William Howard Taft, future president and future chief justice of the United States. His paternal grandfather, Alfonso Taft, served as U.S. Attorney General and Secretary of War. Both Robert Taft's father and paternal grandfather had attended Yale and were members of Skull and Bones. His mother was Helen Louise Nellie Taft. David Pietruza, in his book about 1948, describes Robert's mother, who was known as Nellie, as, Howard, as William Howard Taft's ambitious wife. Like her husband, Robert's father, Nellie was a native of Cincinnati, Ohio, having been born there uh, in 18, I got 1891, that isn't right, I've got the wrong date here. She was the fourth of 11 children of Judge John Williamson Heron, who was a college classmate, catch this, of Benjamin Harrison, and a law partner of Rutherford B. Hayes. Nellie's mother was the daughter and the sister of U.S. congressmen. Nellie's grandfather and uncle were both members of Congress. Starting from 1882, she taught in different schools until her marriage uh, to uh, William Howard Taft. In 1870, 1877, she attended with her parents the 25th wedding anniversary celebration of President and Mrs. Rutherf 
Rutherford B. Hayes and stayed for a week at the White House. Her younger sister, Lucy Hayes Heron, was baptized at the event and named for Mrs. Hayes. As a boy, Robert spent four years in the Philippines where his father was governor. He was first in his class at the Taft School run by his uncle at Yale College, 1910, and at Harvard Law School, 1913. He was a member of Psi Upsilon, his father's fraternity, and like his father and grandfather before him, Skull and Bones, <clears throat> talking about a legacy, and edited the Harvard Law Review. In 1913, Taft scored the highest in the state of Ohio on the bar examination. When the United States entered World War I in April 1917, Taft attempted to join the Army but was rejected due to his poor eyesight. Instead, he joined the legal staff of the Food and Drug Administration, where he met Herbert Hoover, who became his idol. In 1918 and 19, he was in Paris as a legal advisor for the American Relief Administration, Hoover's agency to distribute food to war-torn Europe. He, gained, he came to distrust government bureaucracy as inefficient and detrimental to the rights of the individual, a principle he promoted throughout his career. He urged membership in the League of Nations, but generally distrusted European politicians. In 1920, he was elected to the Ohio House of Representatives, where he served as a Republican floor leader and was Speaker of the House from January 1926, that is in Ohio, to January of 1927. In 1930, he was elected to the Ohio Senate, but was for, defeated for re-election in 1932, generally a Democratic year. It would be the only general election defeat of his career. He was an outspoken opponent of the Ku Klux Klan, and he did not support prohibition. In 1925, he voted against a bill supported by Ohio State representatives who were members of the Klan to outlaw dancing, dancing on Sunday. He opposed that bill to read at least 10 versions of the Bible each day in class. He fought that bill as well. That was sponsored by the Klan. In his speech opposing the bill, Taft stated that religion should be taught in churches, not public schools. And while the Bible was great literature, quote, in it, religion overshadows all else. The bill passed the legislature over the opposition of Taft and his allies, but it was later vetoed by Ohio's governor. Throughout the 20s and 30s, Taft was a powerful figure in local and state political and legal circles, and he was known as a loyal Republican who never threatened to bolt the party. He confessed in 1922 that, this is something important about his recognition of his own persona. While I have no difficulty talking, I don't know how to do any of the eloquence business which makes for enthusiasm or applause. A lackluster speaker who did not mix well or glad hand supporters, Taft was still a tireless worker with a broad range of policy and political interests. His total grasp of the complex details of every issue impressed reporters and politicians. Democrats joked, Taft has the best mind in Washington until he makes it up. In 1936, Ohio Republicans designated him as their favorite son presidential candidate. In 1938, Taft was elected to, his first, to the first of his three terms as U.S. Senator. By 1940, he was a legitimate candidate for the GOP presidential nomination. Despite his advancement and leadership position in the Republican Party, David Pietruska tells us Bob Taft was among the least likely of candidates for any political office. He was, to say the least, not the gladhander. Bob Taft could never be described as jolly, gregarious, or even particularly compelling. Time Magazine pronounced him dull, prosy, colorless, 
with not a tithe of Franklin Roosevelt's great charm and personal magnetism. Taft, Time Magazine mocked, was the Dagwood Bumstead of American politics. He remained, observed David Brinkley, all blue suits, white shirts, bare scalp, rimless glasses, vest, and gold watch. And it was said he looked like, quote, a composite picture of 16 million Republicans, close quote. If Dewey's speaking voice sounded like a cello quartet, Taft's was rusty hinges on the hen house door. Impatient with nonsense, noted journalist and historian and active Democrat, Booth Mooney, Taft was not a man to suffer fools gladly and often he would not suffer them at all. But as his fellow senators, both Republicans and Democrats knew, he was by no means the cold, unapproachable person he was generally pictured as being. He had a dry, friendly wit, liked a moderate drink of scotch in the company of friends, and enjoyed a special rapport with certain senior Southern members of the Senate establishment. To my surprise, noted arch liberal Arthur Schlesinger Jr., I found that I liked him. With Republicans controlling the Senate after 1946, Taft emerged as his conference's unofficial leader. As 1948 neared, Taft seemed a logical contender for the nomination. Questions, however, remained, not merely regarding his tart personality, but also regards his pre-war and even post-war isolationism and his efforts to rein in often destructive labor union power. Cooperating with conservative Democrats, he led the conservative coalition that opposed the New Deal. The Republican gains in the 1938 elections combined with the creation of the conservative coalition had stopped the expansion of the New Deal. However, Taft saw his mission as not only as stopping the growth of the New Deal, but also eliminating many of its government programs. Taft's greatest prominence during his first term came from his big, vigorous opposition to U.S. involvement in the Second World War. A staunch non-interventionist, Taft believed that America should involve any invo involvement in European or Asian wars and concentrate instead on solving its domestic problems. He believed that a strong military, combined with a natural geographic protection of the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans, would be adequate to protect America, even if Germany overran all of Europe. Between the outbreak of war in September 30, 1939 and the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor in December of 1941, Taft opposed nearly all attempts to aid countries fighting Germany. That brought him strong criticism from many liberal Republicans, such as Wendell Wilkie, the party's 1940 presidential candidate, who felt that America could best protect itself by supporting the British and their allies. Although Taft fully supported the, supported the American war effort after Pearl, Pearl Harbor, he continued to harbor a deep suspicion of American involvement in post-war military alliances. Taft's efforts in the Senate to rein in organized labor's authority and power resulted in the adoption of the Taft-Hartley Act in 1947 over Truman's veto. You remember Truman spoke about that in his State of the Union message. When Traft Taft announced his candidacy for the presidency in July of 1947, it was met with vocal and public ire and opposition by labor unions across the country. And that also helped push them towards supporting Truman. Numerous observers wrote off his chances in 1948. Harry Truman and Truman's close advisor and friend Bob Hannigan, who was chairman of the Democratic Na National Committee from 45 to 47, disagreed with that. Don't make the mistake of underestimating Taft, argued Hannigan. Many people think he'd be easy to beat. But that's because they see in his nomination the simple matter of a clear division between the parties. 
The fact is that Taft is a fighter and will make a terrific fact for what he represents. So let me move last and I apologize, I'm gonna go over my time, but I wanna get this in before we end today. Let me move to the third main, main contender who I won't say as much about, Harold Stassen. The story of the third person who was trying hard to obtain the Republican nomination for the presidency in 48, Harold Stassen reminds me of a title of a 1992 book by Jim Moore about Bill Clinton. Clinton, young man in a hurry. Stassen was born in April of 1907 to a Minnesota farm family. He graduated high school at 15. While a student at the University of Minnesota, he supported himself by working as a grocery clerk, a Pullman car conductor, and a grease boy in a bakery. Apparently in his spare time, when he wasn't working those jobs, he was an intercollegiate debater and orator and captain of the championship universal rifle team in 1927. He graduated from the University of Minnesota Law School in 1929 and in 1930 won the Dakota County District Attorney position at just 23 years of age. He was reelected four years later. In 1938, he challenged Minnesota's incumbent governor and defeated him with 59% of the popular vote. At just 31, he was clearly going places. Not only did he become the youngest governor ever of Minnesota, but the youngest ever anywhere. The Washington bureau chief of the Christian Science Monitor, Roscoe Drummond, said that Stassen's gubernatorial administration was a progressive, solvent, and humane Republican administration, which ultimately won even the support of labor leaders. Remember, this was a Republican politician. He was re-elected Minnesota's governor in 1940 and 1942. Even though a Republican, Stassen supported President Franklin Roosevelt's foreign policy and encouraged the state Repu Republican Party to repudiate American isolationism before the attack on Pearl Harbor. During the 1942 campaign, he announced that if re-elected, he would resign to serve on active duty with the United States Naval Reserve, which Stashen had joined with the rank of Lieutenant Colonel Commander earlier that year. In April of 1943, he joined the staff of Admiral William F. Bull Halsey, commander of the Third Fleet in the Pacific Theater. He was awarded the Legion of Merit for meritorious service in that position. For almost two and a half years of service, he was promoted to the rank of captain on September 27th of 1945 and was released honorably from active duty in November of that year. In December of 1946, holding no political office and still barely 39, he announced his candidacy for the presidency. It was the earliest anyone had ever announced. In August of 1947, or by August of 1947, Stassen had been campaigning almost nonstop since he announced his candidacy. Without any party support, party organization support, he built his own independent campaign. In the process, he had toured Europe for nine weeks, interviewed Joseph Stalin, covered 40,000 miles domestically, many by air, he was the first national politician to do that, and written his political philosophy where I stand. He had virtually forced himself into contention by virtue of that campaign, running behind Dewey in the polls and at least even with Taft. His positions were strictly internationalist abroad, a hybrid of liberalism and conservatism domestically, proposing massive public housing, substantial decreases in marginal tax rates, and taking inconsistent positions from time to time on the Taft-Hartley bill. Columnist Drew Pearson reported in June 1948 that certain of the party bosses would almost cut off their left arm before they would let Stassen get the nomination. Suffice it to say, these three leading contenders for the Republican nomination who had announced their candidacies and were campaigning to obtain that nomination 
pretty well covered the political spectrum of American politics within the Republican Party at the time. Dewey and Taft were both born into and lifelong staunch Republicans with Republican Party support behind their respective candidacies. Stassen, on the other hand, was running a relatively populous campaign on the Republican side without, support, without the support of the Republican Party itself or its established leadership. His candidacy was considered almost progressive in, in its nature and position on issues, at least relative to the Republican Party as a whole. Andrew Bush writes, Dewey and Taft represented the two wings. This is really important from a historical perspective. Dewey and Taft represented the two wings of the Republican Party that had been locked in combat since at least 1912. Remember the Bull Moose Party and William Howard Taft, the splitting of the Republican Party? Dewey, the North, Northeastern liberal or moderate. Taft, the Midwestern conservative. Indeed, in the view of one Taft biographer, Taft and Dewey stood as the two great protagonists of the two Republican parties of the United States. The history of all this period of Republicanism was in the practical sense, the history of these two men. Their titanic struggles with each other symbolized two whole ways of political thought and political life. Stassen, for his part, was a self-described liberal, generally, though not invariably, to the left of Dewey. Bush sums up the Republican field this way. In this field, Dewey had the strategic advantage of being in the center, and that's where I put him in this slide. Flanked by Taft to his right, our left, but on Dewey's right in the slide, and Stassen to his left. So to be clear, and here I'll end my lecture, much to your relief, I'm sure, there were splits and divisions inherent within the Republican Party itself because of the divergence of positions the leading candidates represented in their campaign both with respect to domestic issues as well as international and foreign policy issues. And so I wrap up by saying it would be a mistake to view the election year 1948 as, simp as simply being a period of time when the Democratic Party fractured and had divisions which caused the divisions of people who thought themselves to be members of the Democratic Party to start out with. That wasn't the only split or division that happened. It's just that in the Republican Party, <clears throat> those splits or did, divisions didn't lead to a bolting of the party itself or the creation of a third party candidacy by some person seeking the nomination. So we have a battle between two Dewey, Taft, and Stassen, which led to the nomination fight all the way up to the convention, which I hope to talk about next time. So that ends my comments for today. If anybody has the stamina to hang on and talk about this anymore, I'll be glad to, to stay with you and, and do that. But I'm gonna take the slide off for now, Lori. Remember, you need to unmute yourself if you wish to make a comment or uh, ask a question. I'm, I'm wondering what the age requirement was for being President of the United States since both Dewey and Stassen were like under 40. Is no, 35, right? I think. So the Constitution requires a person to be 35 years old, if I remember right. Isn't that right? Yeah, and, and did that go up at some point? Or no. is, that st is it still 35? I think so, yeah. Okay. I think that's correct, yeah. I think it's been that way all the way back since the beginning. Yeah, I thought it was raised at one point, so. Just to comment on CBS Good Morning, Sunday morning, uh, that was June 6th, there was a feature on Truman, and um, it's centered around the war and the bomb, the two bombs. So if anybody wants to watch that, I thought it was kind of timely that we were doing the class and on the national news, you know, they had this 
feature on Truman. So okay. it's out there. Google it. David Chris Wallace apparently is launching a book today or tomorrow on that very subject. So it's uh, obviously coming together and very timely on, on, on Truman and the bomb. So uh, uh, with all of the things that we learned in this class, so that'll be fascinating to see how it picks up nationally and comments on it. I assume those, those sorts of books are reviewed extensively. So you can always learn a lot, even if you don't want to take time to read the book. I can see like the Republicans had. Get real close there, Ted, so I can hear you. I said, now I can assume that your uh, lecture might go viral based on what's going on. <laughs> well, um, you know, we, we don't really have time to go into this in detail, but if you think back to your history, if you know about this, <clears throat> Teddy Roosevelt was elevated to the presidency as a result of, I think it was McKinley's assassination. And, uh, then ran and was elected on his own once, withdrew from running a second time, and essentially um, supported the nomination of William Howard Taft, Robert Taft's father, to the presidency. During Taft's presidency, Roosevelt absolutely couldn't stand what William Howard Taft was doing from a policy standpoint, and so he re-attempted to gain the nomination in 1912, and being unsuccessful in doing that, split off and ran under the heading of the bull, bull moose party. And hmm. so it was looking back to that where Bush said hmm, that Dewey in 1948 represented the Republican tradition or liberal Republican thought, the progressive approach of Teddy Roosevelt and Robert Taft represented the ultra conservative approach of William Howard Trapp, Taft that had so irritated uh, Teddy Roosevelt. So it's important to know that there have been times in the past when the Republican Party truly had differences in philosophy represented within the party itself that played, played itself out in the nomination process and at the convention itself. We've gotten so used to seeing the primary process determine who the nominees are gonna be that we don't think about the importance in 1948, which I hope to point up next time, uh, of the party uh, leadership itself, both at the state level and at the national level in leveraging and horse trading and sausage making and the like uh, to end up with the nominee sometimes on the fifth, sixth ballot. David? Randy? I think it's kind of interesting that those candidates were all so relatively young. Yeah. And today they're all so relatively old. I don't know what to think about that, except just an observation. Well, Randy, I want you to keep this in mind. I think this is, has something to do with it. Yeah, they were relatively young, and especially Dewey and Stassen were <clears throat> guys that were super ambitious. Now, it wasn't true of Truman, and Taft wasn't as young. But my recollection is, with regard to the Social Security Act, when the Social Security Act was passed, it was based upon the act that, the act that for Social Security that had been adopted in Germany years earlier. And the age of 65 was the act that the German social security system had adopted. And the reason that they used age 65 as the age of eligibility for social security was that that was the length of the life expectancy, life expectancy of somebody in Germany at the time. So if you assume someone's life expectancy is 65 years or so, and you say social security will begin at age 65, that eliminates a whole lot of people paying into the system from ever collecting a dime of benefit to the extent that they get it based upon an attained age. So um, I think the reality of our life expectancies were that even by the 1940s, particularly with the effect of World War II, we, don't we didn't have the life expectancies in this country that we have today. We certainly didn't have the proliferation of medical treatments and, uh, and medications and the like uh, that, that has come into existence uh, since then, and if I can go ahead and make this personal, I don't know if I've ever talked about this before in this class or to most of you, some of you know about this with regard to me, if it wasn't for the availability of organ transplant operations, and in my case, heart transplants, I wouldn't be alive and teaching this class. I would have been gone in 2005 or six in the absence of me receiving a heart transplant almost 15 years ago next month. So 
you know, the existence of us old people in this world, and a lot of you can point to those same sort of stuff, things with regard to yourself or someone in your family, there weren't that many people as a percentage of the demographic of the population that were <coughs> healthy enough and functioning well enough to be doing that sort of thing in their 70s and 80s. Well, I'm, I'm relatively confident, though, that my Social Security benefits would not pay for a presidential campaign. No, 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 no. no. No, but uh, speaking to voters, uh, as Truman probably was, uh, in expanding them and increasing them. Yeah. Uh, another area that they talked about the expansion is, I remember that my father as a college professor initially was not covered by Social Security. Right. Uh, it, it was expected that he would have a pension through the university. And therefore, he did not pay into the Social Security Fund until late into his career. When ultimately, the program was expanded and he was uh, uncovered and then did receive. Well, the Republicans, especially the conservative Republic, Republican Congress, and there was a, a, more of an impact by Republicans starting in about 1938, then ultimately in 46, they got control of both houses of Congress. But they fought Social Security tooth and nail from the very beginning. And so at least the conservative branch did. And so <clears throat> what had happened, some, some of what Truman was speaking to was that uh, the 46th Congress had actually changed definitionally some of the people that were eligible to receive Social Security to eliminate certain people that would be considered independent contractors or self-employed people or things of that sort. And so he was fighting to bring those people back into the system and, and increase the level of benefits to people that, that they obtained once they got eligible for it. Because it was a real concern, if you think about it, there was no guarantee that we weren't gonna go back into the Great Depression in 1948. And this issue of inflation that Truman talked about, I think really the bigger issue there was the fear that inflation would run rampant and to value our money to such an extent that, you know, we were like Germany with people lined up with a wheelbarrow full of money to buy a loaf of bread or that sort of thing. And if that happened, people's savings would basically be decimated. That was his real fear, I think, with regard to that topic of inflation. And as time went on and more goods became available to be purchased by people who had money, it softened the cost increases. Good class, David. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, David. Well, I think that's more than enough for today. We probably all need to take a break. Uh, we'll get together next week. I hope to move quickly forward with regard to events that happened in 1948 that had an impact and or on Truman and or politically the election process. Uh, a little bit about the process leading up to the nominating conventions, but not a lot about that. What happened in the nominating conventions themselves fairly quickly, and then perhaps, probably not, we'll step our toe into the general election, but that probably will end up being our last class, with my fingers crossed, I say. Carol McCabot it always says that her eyes are bigger than her stomach, but I'll try to prune the branches of my lecture so we at least get, the, get to the election by the last, uh, by the last class. And, and maybe we'll talk a little bit about the uh, condition of the White House and what happened with uh, Margaret Truman's piano when the, floor, when the leg came through the floorboards on the upstairs portion. I said I'd talk about that a little bit, so I'll try to remember that. All right, everybody. <coughs> but, but David, one, one thought, one nice thing about Spark is you can always pick up where you left off in the next quarter. Oh, yeah, but I'd hate to leave the election pending. I don't want you guys to worry about whether Harry Truman actually got elected. <laughs> uh, well, you could post something out and Lori would put it on the YouTube. <laughs> okay, guys. See you next week. Thank Bye, you. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye. Bye.